Uh, ladies and gentlemen, wild ones of all ages, uh, we're going to talk about managing yourself uh, today. Um, before we get started, um, I have to confess, okay, don't go close to that. Let's see. Um, I'm a little bit of a cliche. So, you know, going through those months between gigs and, and having time, some of you have probably followed me on Facebook or social media. Yes, I've done the bucket list. I've gone around Europe. I've eaten and drank my way through Spain, France, Belgium, Denmark, Finland, and various other countries. Uh, after about a month or two of that, it's fun for about a month. The second month, you know, you kind of get a little worn and torn. By month three, you kind of need to get into a routine. And I started thinking increasingly about managing myself. Kind of the things that I've done at work consistently throughout probably the last 20 years, started to apply those and put some rigor into, into my routines and, and kind of used a lot of the tools uh, and methods that um, I've used for work and then kind of tried to deploy those. Um, increasingly, uh, I think we're managing ourselves. And one of the reasons why I think it makes it more and more relevant today than ever, if you're in the very top management, you don't really have a boss. Uh, you don't have a manager. They're not there to help you. Uh, they're not available. Frankly, it's not their job that much. They're looking after the total business. If you're in middle management, the chances are that your top manager is flying around the world, attending to a fire or seizing an opportunity. If you're in the operational ranks, usually your middle manager is locked up in meetings, <laughs> and we all know that. And they're not really there to, to give you a lot of guidance. I think managing yourself is increasingly important, uh, and I think we're just taking away, if you take nothing else away from here, we're the captains of our own ship and we determine our own destiny. So that's kind of where I want to go. Now there's a huge, huge risk when you talk about something like managing yourself that you end up sounding like one of those airport business books and happy motivational posters. So I want to assure you that I'm going to try to keep it as real as possible and try to speak honestly and truthfully in a language that we can all understand without too many cliches. Uh, and I welcome, we're going to have time for, for uh, Q&A later. Uh, any, any kind of disagreements or any kind of uh, things that you don't agree with, usually those are the most fruitful conversations. It's when everybody vehemently agrees that you usually have a problem. So that's kind of where, where I want to go. Now, the mirror analogy came to me when I started thinking about a conversation I had a few years ago. So a good friend of mine, I shall remain nameless to protect the, the innocent, a good friend of mine was working at Zynga uh, doing Facebook games, and uh, he just left. And he, I asked him to come over, I uh, flew him over to Finland to see us at Remedy, because I wanted to learn about this new cool business model called free to play. It seemed like it had some potential. So anyway, um, we, we end up chatting, we have dinner, and it turns out he's left a ton of money on the table if he would have stayed. Uh, he would have had like a pile of cash over there. And I ask him, I go like, like, why are you leaving? It's not that long a time to wait it through and sit it, sit it out. And he looks at me in the face, and even with a stronger American accent than mine, says, Mattress, I wake up in the morning, and I look at myself in the mirror, and I see the dead eyes of a whore. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that for me, kind of like stuck, struck a chord. And I remember that conversation word for word. He went more and more into it and explained why he didn't like it. And this talk, this talk is not about why he left or why I left. I want to talk more about kind of the, the general, general thinking about kind of uh, managing yourself. Now, one of the things, uh, I actually did a very, very scientific poll on Twitter asking people whether they have a job, a career, or a calling. Um, turns out it was divided like it should. Uh, stats show that about one third of people have a job one third of people have a career, and one third of the people have a calling. Now, the, the interesting thing is, it doesn't really depend on what you do. There's, there's very little correlation. So you have janitors who are cleaning schools who have a call, calling. They're making the environment safe and clean for kids. And you have doctors who have a job. They're not thinking of themselves as saving lives. They're just doing their job. Now, the interesting thing, I, I started thinking about it. What's my calling and why, what gets me up in the morning? Why do I do what I do? Um, so for me, I had actually two sides to it. First one was I want to create environments where people can be happy, productive, and do meaningful work, where we get the awesome talent doing that. Creating a great environment makes me happy, knowing that people can be productive and they come to work feeling with meaning and filled with purpose. Uh, 
gives me joy. The second one is I think the computer games industry gives us a, an, a, an avenue to touch millions and millions of people worldwide, providing them with hobbies, experiences, emotional engagement uh, that gives them joy, gives them meaning, gives, you know, scratch a certain itch. Um, one of the books, kind of, and like I said, I am a cliche, so I did start picking up like a backpack full of books from Orlando Airport every now and then, reading through them and going through my Audible account. Amazon is, is probably the stocks up with all the books I've been listening to. Um, one of the books um, actually says uh, it would be an interesting exercise to, you know, we, we have job descriptions, but also writing, writing a calling description. Like, what is your calling? Why do you do what you do? Um, and that's, that's super interesting. There's nothing wrong with having a career or a job, but I find it much more meaningful to have a calling when you go to work. We, we spend a lot of time at work. Okay, so a word on happiness. Um, an interesting study was done, and there's gonna be some analogies here. I wanted to have some science and some data here so it's not all touchy-feely. An interesting study was done. They had uh, divided the group into pessimists and optimists. The task for the group was to count how many pictures are in the newspaper. There was 42. Um, the, the trick was but by page number three, there was a big, bold headline that said, there are 42 pictures in this newspaper. You can stop reading. Then halfway through, there was another big, cat-sized headline that says, you will get $250 if you stop reading now. There are 42 pictures in this newspaper. Guess what? The pessimists did not see it, the optimists did. Being happy allows yourself to think of opportunity and see much more. Being a pessimist, you get into tunnel vision. How many times have we seen that on game development teams, where you have a pessimistic person who doesn't see opportunity, where you have somebody who's optimistic and looking around, and you connect the dots with lateral thinking, and you find new solutions that you wouldn't normally do? Now, honestly, there are very real stats on happy people being able to find solutions that uh, unhappy people won't, or pessimistic people won't. Okay, quickly look at the picture. How old is the lady? Some of you might know this. Okay, so you're saying, how old are we calling it? 18, and somebody else with a different point of view? 80. Okay. <laughs> so this is, this is just there to, to drive the point home that there are often two, two ways of looking at uh, one picture. This picture has a babushka, and it has a very nice looking large uh, hair French woman there. That's what I see. Um, often people will associate it with their age. The, the, if you're older, you tend to see things this is an older lady. If you're younger, you tend to see the younger lady. The thing is, we often see things through our own lens. And that's all I'm saying is like sometimes it makes sense to stop a little. Are you just projecting through your own focus or are you looking at the picture objectively? Just think about it. I mean, how many times do we see things just through our own focus without really stepping back and looking at the bigger picture? Okay, so a few words on happiness. Old nuns, poison ivy, and Asian women. This is not a party at Keith Kawahata's suite. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a few stories. So in the 1920s uh, in France, in a, uh, in a, you know, where nuns go, it's not a monastery, it's a convent? Yeah, anyway, so they had nuns in their 20s. They asked them to write down their life story. And they looked at these life stories and they divided them, like, sorry, 50 years afterwards, they look at these life stories of nuns who'd been 20 at that point in time. At this point, they were in their 70s. And they looked at the content, they divided them to those who have an upbeat view of the world and those who have a pessimistic view of the world. And their average age was like 75 at this point in time. Turns out, out of the pessimists, 31% were alive. Out of the optimists, over 90% were alive. So, it's, it's good to be happy. It's actually good for your health. There are other studies that prove this. I just found it really, really interesting that they had this treasure of data uh, and just were able to track it down to that. I mean, there's no other, there was no other causality. They lived in the same place. They had the same food in the, in the convent. You know, they had the same habits. It's just that the sad girls died earlier. 
Okay, poison ivy. Um, in Japan, and I think you can only do these experiments in Japan, they, they tied a blindfold on, on a set group of 10 people who were highly allergic to poison ivy. And then they scrubbed their arm with it, and 10 out of 10 had a reaction. The only thing was, it wasn't poison ivy. Their bodies were affected by their mind. Their mind was basically fucking with them. How often does our mind fuck with us? I mean, just think about it. You're having a negative reaction because you think something is negative, not because something is negative. They did the same test, said it wasn't poison ivy, and only two out of 10 had a reaction. So your mind can actually trigger a lot of things. It's, it's just interesting. And that, I think things like that kind of are interesting anecdotes, but I think they also apply to our daily, daily lives if you start to kind of think about that. For Asian women, they did a math test in North America. And the first math test, they told them, you're a woman, women don't do as well in math as men. And guess what? They scored below average. Next time they do the test, they say, you're Asian. Asians do really well in math. And guess what? <laughs> they scored above average. It's about setting your own expectations. You pretty much land where you expect to land. I mean, one of the saddest things, especially in, well, I've seen games, it's people who aim for mediocrity and achieve it. I'm not too worried about the guys who aim high and kind of miss. I'm really saddened by the people who aim for the middle and land right there where they plan to. Okay, a word on happiness. We all have a baseline of happiness that has a more scientific name or whatever. Um, you know, I found myself as well, sometimes, you know, you get, Either down or, well, that would be Starbreeze calling. Sorry. Hey. Anyway. <clears throat> One of the easiest techniques to make yourself happy, and this actually works, um, is to feel grateful. And the easy way to feel grateful is to list down three things that you feel grateful for. There can be small things like, hey, this morning I had the opportunity to have breakfast with my family and had a good chat with my son. Or this morning, I have the opportunity to have great coffee in the sun, whatever. Uh, small things that make you kind of grateful for what you have. If you list them down, you're statistically going to start also changing your own behavior. It's a little bit of a cliche, I know. I can't force myself to write them down, it's just not in my DNA, but I do think about them. And whenever you think about three things that you're grateful for, you will actually change your outlook on life a little bit. It doesn't cost you anything, try it for a week. If it doesn't work for you, You've lost nothing. But sincerely, I mean, just try it. It actually changes your mind, mindset. And like I've told you before, happiness has not only health benefits, it makes you more creative, makes you more of a lateral thinker, you see opportunities, and so forth. Okay, anti-happiness. So they, they've, they've done a study on basically toxic dickheads. So on average, uh, in two minutes, a toxic person will lower the happiness of the entire room. I mean, we've, we've all been there, like, just think about it. It's like a virus comes in, it spreads throughout and takes everybody down. Now we know that it's not just making them unhappy, it's also making them less creative, it's making them less productive, it's making them less collaborative, and this is what happens. So I don't think, you know, one, one of the things is like, it's not a minor character flaw to be toxic. It's almost like, I don't know, if somebody's describing a date like, Brad is so, I don't know, handsome, and he brings wine to the party and cheese. And then you go, well, Brad also rapes cheerleaders. But Brad is handsome. He rapes cheerleaders. Being negative and toxic is not a minor character flaw. It's like raping cheerleaders. Honestly, it's not good. Sorry. Next. Karma. <clears throat> don't worry about the assholes. Like, I've thought about this very often. Like, if you have a toxic and a bad person, they're usually not happy. They genuinely are not happy. They have a miserable life. The biggest punishment they have in this world is being themselves and having to live through that. Karma's a bitch. Just let it go. Don't waste your energy on them. Don't spend any cycles on it. Don't spend any time or emotions on it. Just let go. Frankly, that's the best way to deal with it. Unless you really, really have to. Okay, grit. There's been a lot said about grit. I don't know how many of you have uh, seen the TED talk from Duckworth or read her book on grit. 
Um, and there's a lot to be said for grit. Grit being perseverance, uh, tenacity, trying and, you know, uh, trying over and over again. Now, there's, a, there's an old common saying, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. It's been attributed to Aristotle, but I googled. It's actually from Will Dunn, uh, Durant from 1926. Uh, he's combined some of uh, Aristotle's ideas. So basically, if you think about it, if you smoke constantly, you're a smoker. If you're a positive, upbeat person who does a lot of positive, upbeat things, you're a positive, upbeat person. So just, I mean, think about that. I mean, what do you do repeatedly? What do you want to be? And do the things that you enjoy repeatedly and what you aspire to be. Now, in terms of grit and potential, in games, like in any creative endeavor, we value talent or gifted people. The true fact of life, and there's various studies on this once again, nothing is more common than wasted talent, right? Um, grit and perseverance go a lot further than talent. We're just kind of inclined as human beings to put talent and genius on a pedestal, where it's the guys who are constantly learning, grinding away, who actually deliver the results. Grit is much more valuable than potential, especially in a quickly moving industry like the games industry today. How quickly you learn, how tenacious you are in your learning is much more important than what you know today. I mean, just think about that. How quickly you learn is much more important than what you know today, especially in a quickly moving industry. Okay. We all know this old saying, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Now, this goes back to grit. Grit is not insanity. Having grit does not mean that you repeat it over and over and over and over and over and over again and expect a different result. There are a lot of game companies, there are studio executives who've been around for long, kind of barely surviving, yet they do the same thing over and over again and wonder why their company isn't going anywhere. I'm serious. I mean, we see them at the trade shows. I mean, I'm not putting them down, but if they started looking at, well, maybe there's something to be learned from not repeating the same thing over and over again, you might actually get a little bit further. And there's also been um, a lot of talk about, you know, the 10,000 hour rule. If you repeat something for 10,000 hours, you become an expert. Sounds kind of cool. Anybody can become an expert if you spend 10,000 hours on something. The only thing that is missing from that is if you spend 10,000 hours doing something, analyzing your mistakes, analyzing your successes, and then modifying what you're doing, you become better, you become an expert. If I go and play golf and whack the ball for 10,000 hours and I don't change a thing, I bet I'm still a shit golfer, right? If I analyze it with videos and get a coach and a mentor and whatever, I might actually become an expert in golf. But a lot of people confuse activity with achievement. And there's, this is a whole theme right there. Uh, in a culture like game development, there's a lot of activity and people are very, very busy. A lot of the time people are so busy that they don't get anything done. So I think the key thing is to track your output, not your input. What are you getting done? What are you delivering? Versus how hard are you working? How many hours are you putting in or whatever? Are you achieving the results that matter? Okay, so smart grit would then be better than grit. So kind of, I wanted to put in that final formula there just to drive the point home. Okay, fixed mindset and growth mindset. There's been a lot said about this. Uh, some of you might be very, very, very familiar with this, but I can't walk away from this topic. It's too important. Uh, I think it just hits the nail on the head. There's a lot, of, a lot of us out there, and we see them in the teams, we see them in studios, executive floors, where the first step towards failure is trying. They don't even want to try because they might fail, it might be embarrassing, and you know, God forbid you might not get your bonus or recognition, whatever. So these are two very different kinds of mindsets. In a fixed mindset, skills are something you're born with. You are a genius. You are a god. And that's what you are. In, in a growth mindset, the skills come through hard work and can always be improved. Now, once or twice in every team, there's, there's somebody who's quote unquote complete. They've reached their degree of mastery and they have no reason to learn. 
unfortunately, if you look at the stats, EA used to have a statistic where a new console cycle would come in and about 12% of their workforce couldn't make the leap to the next generation from PlayStation 1 to PlayStation 2, whatever, whether they were a modeler or a programmer or whatever, they, their skill sets weren't transferable to the next stage. Um, in most knowledge-driven industries, what you know today, about half of that is actually applicable seven years from now. I think it's actually more, uh, uh, quicker, uh, the, the rate of change in, in the games industry. But if, you, if you're not constantly learning, you're actually falling behind the curve all the time. In a fixed mindset, they see challenges as something to be avoided and you know, could reveal their lack of skill. God forbid if somebody sees that I'm not perfect. Whereas in a growth mindset, you look at a challenge as an opportunity. It's an opportunity to grow. It's an opportunity to show your persistence. It's an opportunity to push yourself further. In a fixed mindset, effort is unnecessary. Only the untalented need to show effort. You are God, after all, so you can thrive and deliver. Whereas for a growth mindset, effort is essential. You, you realize that this is your path to mastery. With a fixed mindset, God forbid if you get feedback, you get defensive and take it personally, because it is a personal insult to your very aura. Whereas in a growth mindset, you find it useful and something to be learned from. In terms of setbacks, uh, a growth mindset person will see that as a wake, wake up call. It's the rocky thing, you know, it's not about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and get up again and keep on fighting. Whereas with the fixed mindset person, it's a quick, quick, quick reaction to start blaming others for the failure. Okay. So what does it mean if you have a growth mindset? Um, like I said, you're not going to get a lot of managerial attention. So what you need to do is to build some feedback loops into your daily life. Uh, and when I say feedback loops, it sounds maybe a bit more lofty than what I mean. Uh, it means basically taking a cup of coffee, walking around your floor, talking to people, and getting them to be open about your behavior and your performance and how you're doing. The, the majority of the good feedback that you will get will come from your peers and your subordinates. I, I truly believe that. I mean, if you have an open relationship, they will be able to tell you that maybe your behavior wasn't useful, maybe your feedback was too poignant, maybe your behavior is hurting the team's morale or whatever, but you need to get those feedback loops into your daily routine. Whether it's walking around and asking dumb questions, or making sure that you have more formal one-on-ones or you're getting that feedback, is, it's super, super important. Now, self-awareness is easy enough to say. I mean, I think we all feel we're terribly self-aware, but oftentimes I find that the, the feedback that is actually most useful is the one that you intrinsically and instinctively quickly reject because it's either too hurtful or it feels like it's a little bit off mark. Now, the interesting thing is, like, if you, if you think about it and develop the skill, you might not take that feedback to heart immediately, but within a day or two, you'll actually come to terms with it and you'll start to understand why. Once again, it goes back to perspective, old lady, young lady. They see an old lady and they're looking at something that you see as a young lady. So one thing that you might think is one thing for, for other people is a very different thing. And being able to understand and have empathy for them is big. And I think empathy is something that uh, can and should be developed. And it's something that you need to keep in mind no matter how harsh the business is. Okay, let's talk about loops very, very simply. I know there's game designers in the room and, and game makers, so it's a very basic loop. I mean, yes, you've set up your network of impulses that you're getting feedback. How quickly can you make a decision based on that feedback and how quickly can you execute? And the quicker this loop is, the quicker you learn. It's just basic game design. So basically make sure that you have those feelers out there, decide to change something, do it now and then check and recheck and recheck. If you make a mistake, it doesn't matter as much because if you have a quick loop, you're constantly learning quicker. And we already said that learning quickly is important. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about techniques that have worked for me. Um, some of these are more dogmatic, others are more lofty, and some are just uh, a little bit wacky. So the Eisenhower box or the Eisenhower matrix is, I found at least, to be a lot, lot more useful for me than to-do lists. To-do lists, there's like, I now have three books behind me on to-do lists. Basically, this, uh, the summary of all those three books, I can tell you, is to-do lists as such don't work, you need a system. So, 
Otherwise, they just get longer and longer and longer, and they become like a wall of shame. Anyway, <clears throat> the Eisenhower box, some of you are probably familiar with this. Eisenhower used it during the D-Day and plan planning, uh, planning kind of the Normandy landings uh, to you know, divide his time. And he, he had a super, super interesting quote. What's important is seldom urgent, and what is urgent is seldom important. I mean, that's one of the things that I've, I've always found interesting. It's like, um, especially with something strategic, like how can something strategic now be urgent? Isn't strategy meant to be the long-term thing that we are doing? Anyway, um, so if something is important and urgent, you do it now. That's, that's basically the, the rule number one. If something's important but not urgent, I'd schedule that into the, into the calendar and make sure that it gets addressed at the right time, it's planned and it's done. If it's urgent and not important, you delegate it. So basically your flights, tomorrow you need to be here, is that checked, do we have a restaurant? Yes, it's not, it's urgent, it needs to be done, can you delegate it? And then there's a bunch of stuff, you'll find if you put your to-do list into this, that's not urgent and is not important. Just don't do it, <laughs> delete. Stop doing it. And all of a sudden you have much more time. Okay, a personal example of, of, one of one of the techniques I used, I call it the Microsoft sandwich. So 2009, 2010, we were working on Alan Wake, um, and Tim knows this better than, <laughs> than the most in the room, but we still have the scars to prove it. Uh, a very long project, uh, basically went through a reboot three years in development and ended up taking us five and a half years uh, kind of a, a, a tough one. Um, on Mondays, I'd have a call with Redmond, and because Helsinki's 10 hours ahead of Redmond, the call would be around 7 o'clock, 9 o'clock their time, 7 o'clock our time. Then on Fridays, I'd have another sync. On Wednesdays, we'd have a design sync, and on Thursdays, we'd have a production sync. Those were the regular calls, and then there were the fire drill calls. So basically, I was taking four calls from the office starting at 7, which meant that three-hour calls, you know, maybe end up at 10. If you're lucky, you're home at 11, if you're lucky. That was the plan of record. And I was deeply, deeply unhappy. Uh, I wasn't seeing my kids, wasn't seeing my wife, wasn't seeing very much sunlight either in Helsinki. Uh, and I was miserable. And then I decided, I can actually change things. Fuck it, I'm the CEO. So what I did was I built my Microsoft sandwich. I'd come in about a reasonable hour, nine, work till nine till five, and I'd push the calls all the way back to, uh, to nine, uh, nine o'clock in the evening. And I would go home, and from about five or six, for about three hours, I would have time with the family, I would do dinner, I would maybe work out, I would maybe go outside, actually have a life for three hours, and then I'd kick up the call at nine and work till midnight. And that was a much better system than kind of staying at work from nine till 11 and pushing. And my efficiency and my output increased substantially, and my outlook on life as a human being, as a colleague to the team, as a leader, was much better. So you might want to consider how you build your own Microsoft sandwiches. You don't become a victim. I mean, there's too many people who complain about something that don't change something that's systemic. If something's systemic, you need a systemic solution for it. Okay, talking about designing your day a little bit, there's various books on this. Uh, some of you who've looked at my calendar or tried to book meetings, you might have seen a reoccurring meeting at least twice a week, GSD. Um, I had that for 90 minutes at least twice a week. The secret behind that magical meeting and blocking there is it's my own time, it's get shit done. And basically just setting time apart where I can actually do things that are my backlog that I need to get done and unclogged. And, and basically just putting that into the calendar and blocking it off. It's as important as anything else and I usually have an agenda for what I need to do. And remember Parkinson's law. Any work will expand to take the time that is allotted to it, right? And 90 minutes you can get a bunch done if you just write that stuff down. The other one that I, uh, I did for myself, um, Remedy, we had a very open culture and a lot of people would come and talk and we'd been together for a long time and the doors were open and that was part of what made the studio function, it was part of the culture, but it also meant that as a CEO, you were basically serving people, you were a servant. And oftentimes, if you had something difficult that you needed, either intellectually or emotionally, that you needed to attack, you need a little bit of distance, and you need a little bit of time to process that. 
So I launched my own theme of Sushi Thursday. And Sushi Thursday was every other Thursday, so twice a month, I'd come to the office only after lunch. I would take one problem, just one problem, I would go and work out, I would have sushi by myself at Tokyo 55, awesome buffet in Helsinki. I don't usually recommend sushi buffets, but this one's good. Um, and I would solve that one problem. I would come to the office and have solved that one issue that was critical. And I think that added a lot more business value than I would have been there for three, four hours answering people's immediate questions or, God forbid, going through my inbox of email. Uh, word on email, uh, when I resigned from Wargaming, I had over 22,000 unread emails. Nobody noticed or gave a shit. <laughs> Just saying. Don't need to read everything or respond. Okay. So another technique, my favorite, sucking with pride. So, not everything deserves to be done with perfection. Sometimes it doesn't even deserve to be done well. Some things you can just kind of suck and just get it done. There are things that don't add value or people won't notice. How many of you have spent a few nights crunching on some presentation, looking at the language, making sure the layout is good, the graphics are awesome, and then it gets glossed over or barely even looked at? You're putting a lot of perfection and love into something that doesn't matter. So one true story, um, we had to do a feature, uh, feature of collectibles into a game that was already content complete, code complete, and we had all the resources allocated to DLC. So we're going back in and doing something in a way that makes absolutely no fucking sense. And the designers in the room are going, uh, Tim, did you actually do this? Maybe. <laughs> and, you know, having a conversation where you're going like, oh, we just gotta do this, it's a tick box item, otherwise this is not gonna pass cert, we need to put them in. And it's like, this makes no sense, and it's bad. I'm just, we're gonna suck with pride. Now, and it doesn't take a big leader to go in front of the team and demand excellence and demand good performance. I think the hardest thing is to go up to a team that's very proud of their work and go say, guys, we're gonna suck with pride on this one. Just, I mean, some of the things you need to suck with pride. Honestly, think about the things that don't move the needle and just suck with pride. Move over, put your effort into something that does move the needle. I mean, and I don't say this, I mean, I love Paul Azzo in our IT department and whatever, but if you send me a lot of questionnaires and stuff, um, sometimes it's okay to just tick a few boxes and you know, get it over with, focus on something else. Just saying. Okay, techniques. Uh, there's a lot been said about OKRs, that's objectives and key results. Um, Google made it very popular, BC, uh, a popular VC, a very prestigious uh, venture capitalist has, has kind of advocated it and rolled it out from Intel to Google and so forth. The OKRs actually are super helpful for an individual level as well. So you set an objective for a quarter or an objective for a year and you obviously monitor that and you have certain key results attached to that. And that, they can be whatever. The key results can change but the objectives don't change. It's very transparent, it's very easy. It, it kind of keeps you on task and it keeps you focused on what you should be focused on. What, do, what moves the needle? Those are the objectives. And kind of going through that. Okay. Techniques. Let's check the time. Okay. Um, there's some words in the English language, and I guess in any other, uh, when translated properly, like trust, love, friendship, collaboration. They're very heavy words. They come with a lot of positive con connotation. The only problem is that in companies, when they say collaboration, what it really means is usually an initiative, a uh, cross-departmental, cross-location, cross-company effort, initiative, project, process that comes on top of everything else. The fact is, all the time you're spending collaborating, you're not hitting your primary tasks at hand. You're not addressing the key things that add the value and, and move the needle. And if, God forbid, if you don't want to collaborate, you're not a team player and you're not a good corporate citizen. Yet it's so easy to sink hours and hours and hours into workshop and travel that foster this collaboration. And for me, that, the difficulty with collaboration and turning it down is once again, it's a big, very positive word. Who doesn't want to be collaborative? I mean, for Christ's sake. It's like, you don't, what, are you saying that the baby's ugly? I mean, come on, you're supposed to collaborate. <laughs> Nobody has an ugly baby. But collaboration can suck a lot of your time. Learn to say no or at least put the opportunity cost on the table. If I do this, 
I cannot be here doing this. If I do this, this, and this, this and this will be delayed. Try to put a number on it. Collaboration is the most difficult thing that you'll need to get out of if you want to have your high value added items focused on. I'm not saying never collaborate, but always put an opportunity cost on it. Okay, stoic and compartmentalization. Um, a lot of times people focus a lot of energy on things that they can't control uh, or can't impact, and they waste a lot of emotions on that. Um, so from, from kind of in 2004, um, we were pitching a concept to Rockstar in New York. It was myself and Petri Arvilehto. Um, and we, we finally managed to rope in Sam and Dan Hauser and you know, very difficult people to get reach of. GTA takes a lot of their time and when it's not Red Dead Redemption or whatever. And we have a meeting there. We're just flying in for one night, one meeting, and then, then going home. And we're about to go in and pitch. This is like a critical, critical thing for the, for the company. Could mean tens of millions in revenue, a big bonuses, high fives, a new level. And I get a phone call from home. My wife calls, uh, she's had a car crash. Uh, she's, been, she's six months pregnant, doesn't know whether the baby's fine or not. And what I did at that point, I took all that fear, all that uncertainty, all that negativity, and I put it into a box, and I put that box away. We went in, we pitched, we were energetic, we were happy, and we did a fantastic job. I came back to the hotel, opened that box again, called home, and then kind of things you know, kind of went their natural course. But if I would have kept that fear, anxiety, possible sorrow into that meeting, I would have done the right thing for my family. It doesn't help them, doesn't help my team, doesn't help my shareholders, doesn't help me. And I think too often, uh, you, you know, people worry about things or take things with them that they can't impact. If you can't impact it and it's not beneficial, sometimes you need to just put it into a box and address it when you can. I'm not saying it's, you should be unemotional at work, but what I am saying is sometimes it's more helpful to kind of keep things compartmentalized when you need to, especially if it's critical. Okay, junction points. Um, I think a lot of the issues that people have, if they're unhappy with their work, can be solved with just minor fixes. I think people jump too quickly, often. Um, if you enjoy working with somebody, making sure you work with them more. If you enjoy working on certain tasks, making sure that you get more of those tasks is, is an easy way to fix kind of your work day uh, and kind of bring up your job satisfaction. If you're unhappy on Monday, it doesn't mean that you have a bad life. It doesn't mean you have a bad job. It's probably you just have a bad day. If you're unhappy for a few weeks, maybe you consider something. If you're unhappy for a few months, for fuck's sake, change something, because that's not a way to live. And the, the worst thing, uh, I think, is complaining about something, not addressing any of it. So I, I once had, um, I had a conversation with uh, Mike Capps, uh, who, ex-president of uh, Epic, and he was on my board. And I'd complained to him three times about the same thing. And Mike's brilliant, he's, he's, he has a big heart, he's super smart. Uh, but he, he put me on, onto a quiet room, sat me down and said, you've complained about it now three times. Either reconcile yourself to the fact that this is the way it is and stop complaining or do something about it because this is not helpful. And that you know, stops you in your tracks when you're going, somebody you respect goes, shit. And how often, you know, have, are you that guy sometimes where you bring up something that's nagging you but you're not doing anything about it? That's not terribly helpful. Once again, you might not be the toxic guy, but you're certainly not the happy guy in the room, and you're bringing it down. <clears throat> okay, that's me eating a sandwich on the Pyramid Mountains this summer. So, um, <laughs> often people confuse uh, kind of loyalty or perseverance and tenacity with the fear of letting go. Often it takes more strength to let go and move on to a new thing than it does to grab on to the thing that you're doing. This, this applies to friendships, relationships, life situations, and work as well. I mean, just sometimes think about it. Like, are you holding on to something that you shouldn't be holding on to? And why are you holding on to it? Are you doing it because other people expect you to do it? Nobody should be a martyr. You're not there out of a sense of duty for everybody forever. 
You only have one life. Eventually, we will all become worm food. So, <laughs> sorry, that's not a high, high note, but ultimately, think about it. You only have one life to live. Who are you going to live it for? Yourself or others? So I think the key thing, once again, is making sure that you're adding value. When I say add value, adding value to the business, adding value to the game, adding value to the team, adding value to yourself. Take charge. You're, you're the one in charge of yourself. Once again, you're the captain of your own, own ship, and you deserve to be happy. Everyone deserves to be happy. And when I say happy, I don't mean Seinfeld sitcom happy. I mean, you know, something with meaning, something with purpose, something with, you know, something that makes you get up in the morning and feel good about what you're doing. Maybe it's that calling thing. So some of the books um, I can recommend for different reasons. Um, Great by Choice is, is actually really, really good by Jim Collins. Um, the same guys who wrote Built to Last and, and Good to Great. If you're lazy like me, uh, Harvard Business Review's 10 Must Reads on Managing Yourself. It's just one book and you get 10 perspectives on the matter. Um, then kind of The Happiness Advantage by Sean uh, Aker is, is more about the happiness factor and how that impacts, impacts kind of life. I would not read The Morning Makeover, but I had to put it there. Um, I think there's a, there's a chapter there in that book where he describes different people's morning routine. And there's this one executive who works 18-hour days, wakes up at 4 a.m. to go to the gym and pray. <laughs> and for me, at that point, it just felt like it's a little too much of a cult <laughs> to, to go into it. But it's an interesting perspective if, if you want to get, um, get to know that. There's, different, uh, there's 10 different morning routines there. In, including uh, the creator of Dilbert. So, I mean, that was interesting. Uh, from, from my part, you know, obviously it's been a pleasure. Uh, I'd love to open the floor for a discussion. Uh, any questions, observations, tomatoes, or applause? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Of course not. Uh, no, um, so I think, I mean, there's, there's a lot, lot to be said for, as human beings, we know what's right and what's wrong quite often and don't follow it. We know we shouldn't be eating that burger. We know Burger King's not good for you. We know smoking's not great. By the way, the Pilsner Urquell that you had the fourth one last night, probably not a good idea, but we don't always follow that. But I think we need to aspire to something. We need to have a North Star and we need to have a direction, uh, and we need to have measures for that. Some of those are actually very easy to implement, like the three grateful things. It, it takes no effort, it re literally takes no effort. Um, the Eisenhower Quadrant makes my life easier. A, a to-do list gives me an anxiety. It keeps on growing like Elvis's penis, and I, I don't know what to do with it. But uh, you know, an Eisenhower box, at least like, get to compartmentalize it and do something with it. So uh, for me, that, that works. Um, in terms of the kind of happiness factor, uh, I'd certainly say that I can reflect back and, and I can see multiple mistakes I've done uh, in terms of not projecting, like why did I go in in a morning when I wasn't going to project positivity around me? Why not take the extra 30 minutes, go down to the cup of misery, have a cup there, and then you know, come back a little bit lightened by your morning latte, or go work out, do something else. Don't turn up when you're negative. It's not helpful. I think the office would have been a better place if I don't turn up than if I turn up negative. Uh, so, I mean, just things like that, I think I would reevaluate what I've done. So, certainly not perfect by any measure. So th there's two things. I mean, you might have an immovable object, something that can't be, I mean, is, is going to be there. Uh, and for toxic people, what I don't necessarily mean is avoid them, but it's their toxicity. Don't let it impact you. Don't take the virus. Be, be a, you know, develop your immune system where you just address it. This is the way it is. It goes back to the stoic thing. You're not going to be able to change this. Maybe you just let that be and don't waste any energy on it. 
I have to say, I've, I've certainly wasted too much energy, maybe even on hate uh, or dislike, uh, which you're never going to get that energy back. Uh, just let go. It doesn't ultimately, it goes back to karma. It sucks being a dick. Guys, let's help our cameraman to also record what you're asking. So if you have a question, please wait for me to give you a microphone, okay? So any more questions? Oh, wow. Uh, I may have missed it, but could you clarify importance and urgency a little more, just for that that Eisenhower box? Sure. I think they're very similar and, and easy to so understand. So important. Um, let's say something can be very important but not urgent. So let's say by the end of the year we need to have uh, I don't know uh, raised capital, but we still have plenty of time. There's 11 months. It's important. It's critical for the business but it's not urgent. It's January the 1st, by December, whatever, we need to get it done. So what you would do is you would put that into the schedule, schedule thing. You would go, okay, February, make a tour of the VC firms, scout them out. May, go talk to them, do the first intros. Before the summer, get first term sheets, close by September, leave yourself three months buffer. So that would be uh, something that's important, but not urgent. Uh, but if it's important and urgent, it's usually a fire or a business opportunity where um, a critical person has left the company, uh, or a critical person is ill, or you know, on the upside, maybe some partner from China has just called you and there's a business deal that needs to be done by the end of the quarter and you only have a week to get the deal done. Everybody on the plane, Nike's there, we're going to Shanghai. So that would be important and urgent. Uh, referring to this slide where you were talking about uh, being stoic, um, yeah. and restricting um, basically your response to certain negative uh, emotion or maybe even letting go. Uh, how can you certainly tell the difference between that and just brushing your response under the carpet and letting it lie there and basically surface some time later when you don't know? So what I'm suggesting is not that you bury something under the carpet and, and leave it there because it will get worse. What I'm saying is putting it into a box and taking that box out when the time is right, when, when, when you can actually either address it or you can grieve or you can whatever you can do. I'm frankly not saying it's, it's worked every time. Um, you know, have had losses uh, of, of loved ones and there's no way to some, some, sometimes go through that. Uh, and then for those moments, uh, just you can't function as a leader. Uh, nobody needs a leader who's um, not emotionally composed. So then you get the hell out of Dodge. Uh, and you go away and you deal with it and then you come back when you're ready. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Like, super. Uh, you said that you had a really nice uh, and open culture in the, in the remedy and you became a uh, servant because you had like the open the doors. We had the same thing in, the, in our company. But how we are dealing with the stress and being rude, like the, when the, like the six guy is coming with the, some, you know, the minor things, you really want to focus on something. It, you know, it's probably happened to you also a lot because I became like the sometimes rude, which I regretting later because he didn't deserve it. He was just in the fifth guy, you know. So I don't know how to deal with it except the moving to the sushi, you know, so. So I think there's, um, there's, there's a couple of things. Um, so <clears throat> one is, you don't want to reinforce behavior that you don't want to happen over and over again. So if there's a process or there's a designated person, let's say that there is something related to, I don't know, let's call it payroll, make it easy. Uh, and they come to complain to you about their paycheck or whatever. What you need to do is you need to not reinforce that behavior when they have a minor issue, they come to you directly. If you have an organization and you have people res responsible for that, you guide them to the right person. That doesn't mean that you're avoiding your responsibility. You're just not breaking your own system, your own organization, because otherwise you're shortcutting everybody else in the process. But oftentimes what, what I mean by having an open door is people would want attention and they would like to discuss and then it's not so much as um, cutting the own, kind of cutting people into, into that. I think there are, most people get the visual or the audio cues when you go, <clears throat> you know, and others don't, but then you just need to be very direct and say, you know, I still have a couple of more minutes. Do you have something else you want to share with me? I need to do this, that, or the other thing. Um, I certainly think if people want to spend time and they want to share something with you, 
there's usually, it's, a, it's, it's not a, that's usually money invested into the future. Um, and that's kind of those seeds will, will grow into something. So I, I don't think it's usually wasted time. Uh, but what I am not advocating is that you solve all the problems. There's a good article in the Harvard Business Review uh, who has the monkey on their back. So basically the boss becomes the, the guy who, uh, who has the monkey and has to take care of everything as opposed to the person who's supposed to run it. So I would recommend reading that article as well. So let it be the last question. Matthias, thank you so much for your inspiration and for your insights. And uh, everybody, let's also thank Matthias. Okay, thank you.